you know, when things go bad, we'll always need hands to rebuild, we'll always need uh, money to be given, we'll always need our huge organizations to respond, but we also need innovation and new ideas in times of need, you know, especially with all the technology we have these days, we need um, innovators, and I like to fill that little gap in times of need. We all have those moments where we need a little encouragement to get through our day. Someone to remind us that we are not alone. Find peace. Embrace joy. Seek God daily. Welcome to Jesus Calling Stories of Faith. Our guest is Jeremy Cowart, a renowned photographer and the founder of The Purpose Hotel. As an artist, Jeremy endeavors to use his creativity to put the spotlight on situations of need. He discusses his mission of creating an intersection between empathy and creativity and finding his true purpose. My name is Jeremy Cowart. I'm a, a photographer based in Nashville, Tennessee and I'm also the founder of The Purpose Hotel. I was a, a painter first, and then over time became a graphic designer. Did that for a few years, running my own company, and then uh, started shooting just out of curiosity, wanting to explore and learn cameras, and then realized that's all I wanted to do was to be a photographer, and so, because photography got me out to travel, got me out meeting interesting people away from the computer, so yeah, I fell in love with it. I think what separates a professional photographer or a person who does this for a living from the rest of the gazillions of photographers is um, you just you just know it when you see it. You know, their their photo is a piece of art. You know, it's not um, I don't know. There's no real science or official wording. It's just you just know it, and uh, that can still be a 12 year old photographer. It can be a you know, 80-year-old photographer on the other side of the world. You know, this lady, um, Vivian Meyer, was just discovered. She was a nanny through the, uh, I think, 40s and 50s and had been shooting by herself film, and her work wasn't discovered until after she had passed away. And she's now one of the most famous photographers out there because when you saw her work, you just knew this was a brilliant photographer. Yet yeah, she never got paid for a single gig. It was truly a love of hers. And so, yeah, I don't know really how to define it. I just know that it's quite obvious when you see a real photographer's work, you know that that's, that's their gift. So I have a new book called I'm Possible, and it's essentially just my life journey. It's not really about me, because my story, I feel like, is everybody's story. It's overcoming the words I can't, overcoming fear, overcoming doubt. Um, and when I say overcoming, I really mean jumping into those things, jumping into fear, jumping into doubt, knowing that God has laid this before us, and so we have to go into it, go into the darkness. Um, it's really how we have to get in a rhythm and exercise of, of doing, believing, not tearing ourselves apart, and just seeing what we learn from that, even if it does fail. Because in every failure, we still learn. So it's then taking the nuggets of information we learned in the failure. Like I've built apps, I've launched nonprofits, I've launched an online training business, I've done all kinds of things. And some of those I would consider commercial failures, but to me I still learn so much about collaboration and teamwork and so many other things. So um, the book is really a story about um, uh, doing things through Christ who strengthens us, chasing those ideas, those paper wads he give us and gives us, and then just learning through the process. I just love doing things that actually help people, whether that's telling a story or doing whatever, but it has to also be super creative. So I've recently added a mission statement to my website that says, um, my mission is to explore the intersection of creativity and empathy it's not like I set out on that journey years ago. This is just a recent thing looking back on my work. Oh, I've done things like after the Gatlinburg wildfires. I went and used my 
creativity in a very different way to help tell the story. I had grown up going to Gatlinburg a lot with my family, um, and so it felt like a second home in a way. And uh, I was sitting in church when my pastor, Darren Whitehead, was speaking, and I just kept like thinking, I want to do something to help. And um, the words drone and a mattress hit me. Uh, I had never used drones. I didn't know how to use a drone. I didn't own a drone. Um, but uh, I went and found some drone guys and got a cabin rented. And I just had this vision of a drone photographing these homeowners in their old home laying on a white mattress in the stark, dark, brown and black uh, rubble of their former homes, and I thought the emotion of that could help tell their story. And um, so we spent five days photographing about 20 families, and um, you know, that project ended up uh, being featured on Time Magazine and all over the internet and helped raise money for these people to rebuild their homes. After the uh, Haiti earthquake in 2010, um, you know, some 200,000 people died and it was just, we've had a lot of disasters since then, but I'm not sure many have been that devastating. I mean, you had, there hasn't been anything that's wiped out 200,000 people. Um, and so I was just so um, just devastated watching the news and seeing what was going on. I wanted to do something myself to help and so I um, figured out a way to get down there and just tell stories of people because the, the media was not telling stories, they were just showing the stats. This is how many buildings have fallen down, this is how many people have died, but I wasn't really hearing the, the humanity in it all and so I just went down there myself and wanted to give people basically a microphone in the form of a photograph to kind of a visual tweet to tell their story. and. Um, it ended up being showcased in the United Nations to help raise more money to rebuild Haiti uh, through the United Nations. And so, yeah, I just love trying to figure out how to be a, uh, an innovator in times of need. When I go into situations of helping others, um, I have to really figure out how, to, how does this actually help? I can't go in there and make this about me. I can't be the rock star photographer that's coming in to take pictures, get out, and get good images, and splash them around. It has to actually tell a story and to help. And um, I'm not always successful. Some of my projects haven't really helped. Um, but I can say that my intentions are always 100% pure to help and to raise money and to tell a story. Um, and so I think that's number one. And I think when the people understand that you're there to truly give them a platform, help them raise money, help them just through a creative way get back on their feet, then they're open and willing to be a part of your project. Um, but if they see you just trying to be selfish and take cool pictures or whatever, then you're not gonna have a lot of luck. So I've recently noticed on social media, not even recently, but for a long time now, that we're becoming increasingly obsessed with ourselves. I think there's just danger in that and becoming so obsessed with ourselves and the way we look and the story we're telling that it's just, it's, I mean, there's science that shows it's causing everybody else to be depressed and we're comparing ourselves, oh, I don't look that good, I didn't go on that vacation, when in reality, none of that is true and none of that is real life and so, I just crave to, to see more um, people trying to help with their their tools, use their accounts to, to do good things, to um, showcase others, to tell other stories. I mean, we, we can't get enough of that. Because um, I think we all get to a point where we realize like, oh, none of that matters. The things that society tells us to chase. And so um, what I realize is, is that my greatness should serve a greater good and that is our greater God you know it's the it's the purpose he gave me in life and I'm not fulfilled until I find that purpose and then once I do it's amazing how fulfilling life can be and how much vision um, God can give you once you really find that that thing that you know he's called you to and so you know I, I think of ideas as a little paper wad with the message on it that God throws at me and I think he throws those at everyone, but most people don't acknowledge it like, no, it's not for me. 
they don't even open it or when they do open it like oh no I can't do it it's too big and so I've just always loved the the excitement of, of hitting having those paper wads hit me and opening up like all right this is crazy but I'm gonna do it I'm gonna jump in and uh, figure it out and it's been um, and they seem to get bigger and bigger and bigger uh, and I just take that responsibility and I'm called to it and then there's definitely a sense of responsibility now because I do feel like I'm fortunate enough to have really discovered my calling. It's a big calling, um, but there's nowhere else I'd rather be. We'll be right back with more of our interview with Jeremy Cowart and a new project he's pursuing that he hopes will bring the plight of those in need to more people's attention and benefit those same people with dollars and resources after this brief video from a Jesus Calling ministry partner. The Brooklyn Baptist Church in West Columbia, South Carolina, recently celebrated their annual Women's Day. The team that plans the event discusses the impact of their weekly prayer call and reading Jesus Calling together. My name is Trey Taylor with uh, Brooklyn Baptist Church, and I was blessed with the opportunity to become chair of Women's Day 2019. Norma had uh, introduced me to Jesus Calling. Gosh, Norma, I don't know how many years it was ago that we met at the Burger King right here. And, and you just spoke so much life into me and you gave me that Jesus Calling. Can you tell me why you did that? At that time, God just kind of showed me that Trey were going, was going through some things. And I knew that that book helped me. So I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that <laughs> whatever you saw in me, that you were obedient. Because, you know, we can, God tells us to do some things, but we're not always obedient in doing those things that God tells us to do. So I thank you, not only for giving me the Jesus calling and then the Jesus always, but for always pouring into me. So my name is Jamie. I am 15. Jesus calling was, it was a reminder every morning that you needed to believe and you needed to let God be in everything that you do. Mm -hmm. Being a freshman in high school, there's a lot of drama. <laughs> so um, she usually calls me and I said, well, what did you read today? And she's like, mommy, this day helped me a lot. And she would break it down for me as to why. So I'm very excited that I feel like I have backup. I have support. This is my support system from when she's not with me. When I came to the first uh, meeting for Women's Day, we were discussing having a 5.30 Tuesday morning prayer call. And um, the center of our prayer call would be the Jesus Calling. We were discussing times and they said 5.30. I said, I won't be on that call. But um, I did join the call and the call has blessed me because it gave me the opportunity to really get into reading the Jesus Calling, and as Norma just said, it sounds like God is talking to you when you're reading it. So it's been a blessing. We use the Jesus Calling every Tuesday morning on that call as the basis of, or the foundation of the call. Then we do prayer requests and we actually have a prayer time and we have a discussion time. We read the scriptures that are um, coordinating with the Jesus Calling and it's been life-changing. I just feel like we have a real bond and this Jesus Calling and that 5.30 prayer meeting just cemented that. It cemented that for me. Josie, I know that this has been an incredible time for you because the very first meeting that we had, you shared with us. As you all know, I was diagnosed with breast cancer two weeks prior to coming into the meeting, and I wasn't sure that I even wanted to tell the people. When I was diagnosed, I said that I was in the fight for my life. Yes. And then to be on the Tuesday morning call, I needed that. Several months later, last Sunday in February, yes. you said to us, there were no cancer found on the PET scan. Yes. 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 The God that I serve can heal me from right here. Yes. 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 The Women's Day group has been so gracious and loving to me. And y'all have shown me that. And the Jesus Calling book has just shown me that God loves us no matter what. No matter what, through it all, He loves us. Aside from his day job as a photographer with a purpose, Jeremy is working on a new project, The Purpose Hotel. 
While on his way to a meeting in a hotel room in Los Angeles a few years ago, Jeremy was struck with an idea for a new global hotel chain that could help make the world a better place. You know, I'm currently in the process of building a hotel chain, and you talk about scary. I'm going from being a single self-employed artist to now building a, a mega brand that will exist one day, and um, it's scary as all get out. But I just, um, I've seen over the course of my career that one idea leads to the next, leads to the next, and uh, all those ideas are from God, and so, in 2012, I had a photo shoot uh, at the Standard Hotel in Los Angeles, and I was just walking through the hallway to my room, and the uh, room numbers were designed like name tags from the 80s. It said, hello, my name is room 121. And for whatever reason, that caught my eye. And um, that's cool, they rethought the room numbers, but what if every room had a story? Because that story would be what if it was a child and their face and their name and it was telling, you know, sponsoring this child. And then I looked down at my room key and I was like, oh, and the room keys could be connected to the giving keys. Um, and then when I walked in my room, the rest of the idea hit me. You know, the, the internet fee could fight human trafficking, the soaps and shampoos could come from Thistle Farms. Um, just the whole vision for the hotel hit me. And it, again, it was a it was a paper wide moment from God and um, I was just so overwhelmed by it, but moved by it. Um, and then I spent three years, literally from the age of 35 to 38, saying, nope, God, you got the wrong guy. I cannot do what you're calling me to do. Um, and then um, 2015, he kept knocking, kept nudging me and um, I remember flying over New York City one day and just thinking, man, all of those skyscrapers had to start somewhere, like with one person. Every one of those buildings has to start with somebody. And if God has called me to be one of those people, then why not, you know? So here we go, let's jump in and figure it out. And now we're, you know, in the process of doing just that, building a, a really large building downtown Nashville. The enemy is gonna be always trying to take your eyes off the road. Um, Whereas God has set the road ahead of me, he's laid the path and the enemy's over here just trying to distract me. And um, who am I to think that I can build a new hotel chain in the midst of the hottest city with all the biggest developers? Um, but I'm like, you know what? God has called me to this and this is what he's set in motion. So I'm just gonna keep walking knowing that the vision he's given me is so different than the rest of the industry and that I just have to own that and keep walking. I have so many friends who are so hard on themselves, including my wife, who uh, she's a new, newly uh, uh, established real estate agent, and her doubt and her fear and so it just overwhelms her. And it has me too, and it still does. My wife has always been uh, an extremely disciplined um, uh, person in terms of her quiet time with the Lord in the morning. She. Um, we have four kids, and uh, she somehow has a superpower to not function on eight hours of sleep. I have to have my eight hours of sleep. So she wakes up really early, like 5 a.m. Our kids usually wake up around um, 7. I usually wake up around 6. I'm usually up before the kids, too. But, um, but she just has to have that quiet, truly quiet moment on her back porch on a swing with the Jesus Calling uh, book and her devotions. And um, I mean, she's been doing that for as long as I know her. Um, and it's so sweet to walk out every morning. My wife's just out there on the back porch with her robe and a book and the Bible and just, just quiet. And then of course, when our kids wake up, it's utter chaos. Um, but I just have such an admiration for her um, and her discipline uh, to do that every morning because it's not easy when you're a oh, mom of four kids. May 9th says, don't be so hard on yourself. I can bring good even out of your mistakes. Your finite mind tends to look backward, longing to undo decisions you have come to regret. This is a waste of time and energy leading only to frustration. Instead of floundering in the past, release your mistakes to me. Look to me and trust, anticipating that my infinite creativity can weave both good choices and bad into a lovely design. Because you are human, you will continue to make mistakes. Thinking that you should live an air-free life is symptomatic of pride. 
Your failures can be a source of blessing, humbling you, and giving you empathy for other people and their weakness. Best of all, failure highlights your dependence on me. And I think when we carry our ideas and our dreams by ourselves, we're only going to continue to get demolished by the doubt and the fear. But when we speak those things, when we text somebody or email somebody or just share our dreams, then we've held ourselves accountable. And then our loved ones can say, hey, hey, how's that, how's that dream going? You know, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh gosh, I guess I, guess I have to start. Because that's what I did for three years with the hotels. I would just, even on stage, I would tell audiences, I'm going to build a hotel. I didn't even believe it in the moment. Um, but then there, there becomes this, this swell of community that starts to really support me. Okay, I really love that hotel idea. Like, you need to do that. And even my wife in the middle of the night sometimes, she would just say, gosh, I hope before you die, if you do nothing else, please pursue the Purpose Hotel. Um, and I could have just kept that idea from her. But she was the one just over and over and over just telling me, please do that. So I think we have to speak things, if nothing else, just to build up the community around us to believe in us. I'm a photographer. I've just got a camera. But I'm just going to take pictures of people and show them the beauty of who they are. Nothing in it for me. It's not a portfolio thing. It's just giving ourselves away. And um, I think anybody can do that, you know. Uh, even if it's not your specific talent, even if it's giving yourself away and listening to somebody or loving somebody, that's what God calls us to do from the get-go. So it's the most beautiful thing we can do. To find out more about Jeremy Cowart's photography and the Purpose Hotel, visit jeremycowart.com. You can pre-order Jeremy's new book, I'm Possible, from your favorite book retailer today. Next time on Jesus Calling Stories of Faith, we talk with viral sensations, the singing contractors. While working on a house one day, Indiana natives Aaron Gray and Josh Arnett decided to take a break and film themselves singing, How Great Thou Art. Little did they know, their video would garner more than 100 million views and touch hearts around the world. Josh and Aaron share what drives them to sing. I think people was blown away that just a couple ugly guys could belt out some tunes like that. And literally dropping the tool belts where we stood and actually worked. It wasn't a made up place, it was actually the job. Dropping it and saying, let's do this tune, we recorded that thing one time. We had no idea what it would do. And uh, still staggering, within 32 hours, I had a million views. And, and that, that means a lot, but saying all that to say this, what we like most about it is that people are hearing the message of encouragement and the gospel through a simple song, through a couple of simple guys. Thank you for watching Jesus Calling Stories of Faith. To learn more about how to keep up with our shows bi-monthly and to listen to our weekly podcast, please visit youtube.com slash Jesus Calling Book to view and hear previous episodes and to watch a short informational video about how to access all things Jesus Calling on audio and video formats. Plus, learn how to subscribe to our podcast and video channels. Your subscription helps get the word out to more people who will benefit from these inspirational stories of faith.